afternoon and welcome to the Gibson Museum and Cultural Center. Is it uh, 3 o'clock yet? Yes, 01. Oh, 301? Okay. I'm Boris Brumfield and I am the president of the Friends of the Gibson Museum. And we have here with us the vice president of the Friends of the Gibson, Ms. Millie Simon. We have the office manager for the three county museums, Corey Jansen, is with us. And we're being videotaped by Gabrielle Fellows, who will be putting this video on the county's YouTube page, the museum's YouTube page. We're here for part two of our discussion of geothermal and its evolution here in Lake County. John Graham has joined us this afternoon. John was an operator in the geysers for, and he did different jobs in the geysers for 36 years? Yeah. 36 years before he retired. He is a resident of Cobb. And how long have you all been up on Cobb, you and your wife? Uh, since 1980. Since 1980, okay. So last month we began talking about the geothermal and how it was part of the Native Americans who were here, the first people who were here, um, used the muds and things in the geothermal and also were aware of it from a medicinal standpoint and um, just that it was there and part of what was in this area, the Mayakamas area. Mayakamas, if that's what they want to call it also. It's part of the Ring of Fire in the Pacific Ocean going around to the Philippines and uh, Manila and those areas and then it comes up through South America and on through the west coast of the United States and up through Alaska is this big ring where the magma is closer to the surface than it is in other parts of the Earth's mantle and the Earth's crust. So um, originally they started developing um, the hot springs and they were, it's a misnomer that it's a geysers. It's more of, um, of um, let's see, it's not a geyser because a geyser is something that shoots off periodically. There is a geyser that's about 15 miles from here on Tubbs Lane in um, Napa County. And so that's the second major geyser in the United States. The first one, of course, is Old Faithful in uh, Yellowstone. Yes. In Yellowstone. And then we have one very close by. But <laughs> these are actually uh, where the, the water is heated, superheated, and bubbles up to the surface. Uh, that's OK. I'm correct. Oh, good. John's going to do all the correcting. Yeah. Thank you, John. And um, but they they started in the early 1900s with the Geyser Hotel and yeah. and and uh, then began with developing some early wells there to um, generate uh, heat and electricity. That was in the late 50s, early 60s. Late 1950s and early 1960s, and that was all on the Sonoma County side. Yeah, and then in about when they realized how um, much potential there was in this area to develop um, this industry and develop the steam, that was when they started coming over to the Lake County side. And one of the things that I didn't mention at the last meeting was, at one time, they take about an acre of land to put a drill pad on there to drill and to develop the well. But when they started doing the diagonal drilling, they could get uh, multiple wells from one pad. Because one of the things that concerned us as people who lived here was tearing up the mountainside with all these different well pads. But because they could drill diagonally, it, it didn't tear it up quite as much. Okay, so John, you're on for doing some corrections. And then we can go on. <laughs> Cal Calvin will have to give you straight about all the wells. Okay. I had very little to do with that. Okay. This, the difference of the geysers to all the other geothermal development mm -hmm. is that it's 
in common with the original one in, in Italy, which has live steam. It doesn't have hot water. The ones in Southern California use the hot water. Mm -hmm. But here, we had those pictures there? Yes. Real. They, we had real guys. Yes. And that's where they started by capping to make it, you know, they knew they could use it. So can you just sprint the clip? They started capping those and yeah. capturing the steam. The first one that mm -hmm. they was the wild well, it was known as. It was about, the first two units were right down on the creek practically, units one and two. Mm -hmm. And the wild well was right above them. And the first, it was the first time they tried to capture a live well. Mm -hmm. They lost four cement trucks and more before they could stop it when they tried capping it. They did eventually cap it, but yeah, they just caved in on them as they were doing it because they didn't know what they were doing. You know? so, you know, and like I said, Calvin can definitely fill you in there. But when I came up there, it was, uh, let's see, 1976. So the geysers was pretty well underway for the final growth stage. I was there, the original growth was one, two, three, four, five, six, and I think seven and eight, which, that was the original group that told them, hey, we can really make some here. Mm -hmm. So when I came up, I came up as a painter. Wow. I started as a light, well, ground, and in Chico. And then they said, well, you want a job, you can be a painter in Moss Landing. So I was commuting down there. And then I, they, they said, oh, but we got another job up at the Geysers. That's closer to Chico. And so I came up here and one trip, I was so, because you, you have a base when you're in a traveling thing like that. And mine was in Chico. I, as soon as I landed here, I said, I want to be right here. This is, I like this. And back then, there were no roads at the geysers except from Sonoma. But I didn't want to live over there. I like calm. I like <laughs> the mountains and that. So that's where I came in. And so when I started up there, I was climbing the walls of the power plants to paint them. Wow. You used to just crawl up the side and tie up to the that little thing in there. Crazy stuff. Oh anyway, so we, that's what I was doing. So I really wasn't involved in the development at that point. It was just, it was the best paying job I'd ever had, and I wasn't going to give it up for anything. <laughs> so I said, I don't care if I get covered with paint, you know, I have to stay up all night. Because what they did with painters was painters worked whatever hours you wanted them to. And if there was something nasty and they didn't like, nobody liked doing it, they get the painters to do it. Oh. <laughs> so, as the development of the geysers went, the, the steam has a nasty off gas in it mm -hmm. that they were just, they, it, it, it's a, called a non-condensable. So when it would go, when the steam would go in the condenser, this non-condensable gas would build up at the top and started working its way down. Pretty soon, no steam would go through because yeah. it would be full of this. So they just drilled a hole in it and ran the pipe yeah. outside. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it takes like 40 parts per million to kill you. And the stuff going out was like 480 parts. Mm -hmm. And they were just blown into that. Mm -hmm. And so they thought, yes. well, you know. And they got away with that as long as I was in the paint department. We were Painting those pipes. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, so they uh, kept developing. So then they had to develop something to capture that. Mm -hmm. Couldn't put it out in the atmosphere. So they pumped it into the cooling towers. They had to put, uh, oh, they tried so many different things. Fairy flock was the first thing that the painters got to do. They put a, a turnstile on, and you dump bags of this flock stuff and it went into the tower and it would capture and turn to mud. 
Now you think of cool I mean the cooling towers you could swim in, it was that clear. I mean that water before they did this was crystal clear. They inject it into the ground, be like putting drinking water in the ground. Well, when they did that, all of a sudden the cooling towers wouldn't work anymore. They filled I mean the cooling towers were about that deep. So they uh, filled them with mud. Once they fill with mud, there's no, that's where they get the cooling water for the condenser to make, mm -hmm. to make the condenser work. So then they uh, figured, well, we got to get it out of there. So they shut the plant down. They bring in vacuum trucks. And guess who gets to vacuum the mud out? <laughs> the painters. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Oh, let me do that. Please. Oh, you bet. So they did that for a number of years. I, did, I was in the paint department for five years. And the last time I got to do, got to do, a vacuum the thing out. Like I said, it's this tall. You crawl in there and stand wow. like this with a vacuum hose wow. until you get it all out of there. Well, I got older. I, it hurt my back. I went out for like two weeks with a bad back. And I said, oh boy, I gotta get out of this. You know? And as it happened, they decided this mud wasn't such a good idea. So they said, let's try something else. Let's put it into this. We'll pump it out and put it into this. They, they had a means of pumping it out of the tower and putting it into a sludge pit. But then they needed somebody to run that sludge pit so they could pump it into trucks so they could take it away. But they couldn't use painters because there was machines. You had to turn them pump on and turn them pump off and you know, load the trucks and be there all night long, and, which painters were doing anyway. Somehow they didn't get us to do that. And a friend of mine who had been a painter that was an operator said, you've got to get out of this. And he says, they're going to open up these APPO jobs, apprentice power plant operators. Okay. So all you did was, you, were, you had nothing to do with the power plant other than these mud slurry things that they had going. And so, I had five years by then. Nobody else in PG&E wanted to go to the geysers, so I could. I had my. I got first choice. I got my job as an APPO. And I thought, oh well, this is good. And so I was out of the cooling tower, wearing clean clothes. Had 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 to work shift work. Mm -hmm. That was the difference. I worked all night as a painter sometimes, but. Now I had to learn how to get up in the middle of the night and go to work and shift every eight, every, geez, it's been that long. Like every week, anyway, you change shift from days to, to swings to grades. Three shifts every time. So, I, I, it paid better than the, well, actually I had to take a cut and pay. To be because, an apprentice. Because I was already a journeyman painter. So I took a cut, yeah. The pay is still good. So I did that. And at the end of a year, they built three more power plants. So mm -hmm. now they had a shortage of operators. And I have here, John, an example of showing which power plants existed from 1960 to 1969. At that time, they were all in Sonoma County. This is the county line. This is Lake County over here, and this is Sonoma County over here. So that's how many power plants they had between 60 and 69. Then between 1970 and 79, yeah. they developed a number, uh, quite a few more power plants. And, mm -hmm, and they shut down power plant one, two, three, and four. So these were the active power plants between 70 and 79. So if you want to pass this around again, you can look at those power plants. And when things started to get active 
in Lake County. Oh, I get that on all kinds of mm -hmm. Good for you. Mm -hmm. I was looking at that. So this is uh, from 1980 to 89. And this is the power plants in Sonoma County are over here. And then they started to develop power plants in Lake County. And each one of those power plants had approximately between 15 and 30 welds yeah. that went to each power plant. So um, the first power plant that I was aware of was Unit 13. That was built in 1980. And it was originally built for 138 megawatts. That was the largest power plant in the whole world. Geo that had geothermal, yes. The yeah. largest geothermal power plant in the whole world. And then um, Muriel and I began getting involved when they developed Unit 16, which was six tenths of a mile from Anderson Springs. And that was going to be a 110 megawatt power plant. So by that time, between 1980 and 89, they built the Bottle Rock Power Plant. Um, they had the Santa Fe Power Plant, which we called Occident. Was, yeah. was that Occident? It was Occident. Occidental. Occidental. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they had uh, Unit 16, and then they had the Bear Canyon Creek Power Plant. Um, so within this period of time, within two and a half miles of Anderson Springs, there were eight geothermal power plants within a two and a half mile radius of our little community that was in this canyon. And um, Lawrence Livermore Labs in the 80s did a air quality test where they set up balloons and things, and they looked at the air that comes from the Pacific Ocean from Sonoma over to Lake County, down through the, the um, canyon in Anderson Springs, out through the valley where the sewage treatment plants are in Middletown, and then down out to Sacramento. So it would come in in the morning, and at night it would reverse and come from the Sacramento Valley and come back up that canyon and go back over, uh, and that's what they found. So once they had that information from a standpoint of the community that lived there, we said, you can't just vent all of your um, off gases or non-condensables into the air. You need to do something about that to protect the community that has been there since 1876. Right around. <coughs> yeah, about 1876 the Anderson Springs community developed and we had hotels and different people had um, uh, built summer houses and things of that nature. So I'll pass this one around and then from 1990 to 99 we had these active power plants in our community. So pass that one around. Mm -hmm. Um, who owned the land in which they drilled? Okay, so who owned the land that the wells were drilled on? They were owned by a number of different families and communities and or um, organizations. For example, they drilled on the Verdon Vales, uh, which was a summer camp that actually uh, Chauncey Gibson actually owned at one time. He owned Castle Rock Springs, which is off Highway One Set uh, uh, Socrates Mine Road. That he owned that and um, then sold it. Um, that they, they were owned privately by people like the Prathers and other individuals. And as a matter of fact, some community members they offered um, people in our community uh, subsurface rights to to allow them to drill under Anderson Springs, and there were a number of us who chose not to allow that to happen. Um, but um, different parties, uh, there are a number of large landholders around Anderson Springs, and they did lease to geothermal. Uh, but the slant drilling, the diagonal drilling, they could be away from your, your property, you know, over a half mile, 
and they could still drill under <laughs> your property. Oh yeah, they got uh, good at it. Uh, they, yeah, as yeah. John says, they got good at it. You know, finding finding these uh, the steam. Yeah, yes. They learned how to diagonal drill, mm -hmm. and that's where Calvin comes in. Mm -hmm. all that, I knew it was going on, but it was you know that that part I didn't have anything to do with. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, wells were. Like you said, they were about a mile deep. Mm -hmm. sort of thing. You're mm -hmm. talking about, I've heard, the newest idea is to go deeper. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's happening yet, but that would be the next. Mm -hmm. That would be the only stage to bring back the geysers, because the geysers is declined. Mm -hmm. you know, all, like you said, they close those power plants and stuff. Well, because the, other, the newer plants were more economical. They used the steam better, mm -hmm. but it was also the steam was everybody wanted to get in on it. It was the time of having green power mm -hmm. geothermal screen power. And all of a sudden everybody wanted to have a geo. So the final part of the growth was everybody getting involved to a point that they depleted the steam fuel to a decaying part. It has reached its decay now, and it's like, I think it's like six or 700 megawatts. Still a, a very large output, but I mean, it was 2,000 when it was at the peak. When not all the plants were built, but when the most plants were running at their highest level, it was around 2,000 megawatts. So it's gone down a great deal. And I'm yeah. sure they, all of the people up there would love to have it back like that. Because the plants can still do it. You know, it isn't a problem with the plants. It's a problem with the steam. Originally, when they were building Unit 16, and we looked at the environmental impact report, they gave the, the plant uh, a life of 20 to 35 years because they felt that they will have used all the steam by then. But then we had the wastewater uh, recycling that was created originally by Lake County Sanitation District, Lake Osan. And um, because the county was having difficulty disposing of treated effluent, there was a law saying you cannot put and treated effluent is the water that comes from the sewer plants. You could not discharge it into Clear Lake. That was a determination that we made. Other communities, large communities like San Francisco and, um, and Los Angeles, they, dis they have permits to discharge into other areas. But we decided in Lake County that we were going to spray irrigate fields. And at one time, when you drove past Lakeport, North Lakeport, you could see the sprays and you'd see this green field in the middle of summer. And land in Lake County doesn't stay green all summer for, for the most part. And they were uh, south, uh, excuse me, north of the city of Clear Lake also. But they created so much effluent that they couldn't spray enough. And so the county had a problem. And they said, what are we going to do with this effluent? And the geysers were diminishing in the amount of output. And they knew they, uh, originally, they were putting in, I think it, it's 35% of the liquid that comes out of the ground was being recycled and it re-injected into the ground only 35%. Well, if you do the math, after a while, you have less and less and less there available. And though the heat source doesn't go away, the magma that's centered, they needed um, a medium to transfer that, that heat source of the, the heated effluent or the heated water to turn the turbine. So that was when, in the 1990s, Lake County began their project of taking treated effluent, pumping it up to the geysers to be re-injected. 
Well, once we started, Sonoma County was having issues with lots, of, that was when we had lots of rain and the water would flow, the treated effluent would flow into the Russian River and people were complaining about sewer water going into the Russian River. And so then Sonoma County also began developing a pipeline into the geysers. And what they have done is they have tested and tested where you can put that treated effluent. Some places, some of the wells, if they put too much, then neighboring communities get earthquakes because it shifts the shale un or shifts the earth underneath by pumping too much into a particular area and we get those rolling earthquakes or those sudden jolt earthquakes. The other thing is they didn't want to put too much water or too much treated effluent in certain wells because it would kill the well. I mean, it would just wet it down so much that it wouldn't produce steam anymore. So it's been a process of figuring out where to put the water over the years so that it could continue to generate steam without either killing the well or creating too many earthquakes. And that's where they're at. Uh, they have it down, yeah, so they're at six or seven megawatts. It's a lot of, it's still a lot of power. Mm -hmm. I don't know, what I, Italy was the original one. Yes. And I think they're, I, I have, they did the same thing. They over, you know, they got to a point. And I don't know if they came up with the same re-injection, but they're still alive mm -hmm. and running. I don't know mm -hmm. what level they're at. But ours has pretty much settled out. So it's what it is unless they can figure some way to improve it. You know, and the thing is, the water comes from the cooling towers. You, you see the cooling towers with all the things going on. That's where the steam, after it goes through the turbine, turns to hot, very hot water, 125 degrees, and they pump it into the cooling tower to cool it because they need cool water to condense the steam. So it's a cycle, just a circle around. Well, that's where the 30% comes in. You lose 60% to that steam you see going out the top of the tower, but it's necessary for the way they run the power plants to have the cool one. And it's inch oh, yes, go ahead, Carrie. I was just wondering, for the plants and the wells that they took offline, mm -hmm. so I'm assuming are no longer being used, mm -hmm. Did is there an effort to return the land to what it once was, remove all the Equipment. The question was with the power plants that they took offline as well as the welds that are offline, is there an effort to um, return the land to what it once was? And in many instances there are requirements that they have to rehab that land. Um, some of the power plants that were originally done, as John said, are not energy efficient it costs too much steam to run them, so that's why they decommission them. Or they use too much, I think there are a couple that are in Sonoma County also, that have been decommissioned. So they haven't taken the plants down themselves, but they've refurbished the areas, or re they, um, what do you do when you plant those trees? And they've uh, rehabilitated and put, uh, uh, seed on there, just as they do on the highways when they... Hydro seed? Hydro, hydro seed. seed. They'll, they'll hydro seed around those areas. So, yes. But if it wasn't in the original permit, then mm -hmm. they didn't really have to do anything. Because the original did. permits were, you know, <laughs> grandfathered in, I like right. will say. The old ones. So, mm -hmm. you know, the old, the old permits, the original so ones. Uh, they got off the hook totally. <laughs> well, what was being permitted in Sonoma County was definitely different than what the permits in Lake County required. Yeah. And because, one, there were virtually no one on the Sonoma County side. The people were so few and far between mm -hmm. on the Sonoma County side. That's why their pipes and plants are silver, whereas ours are green so that they blend in more with the, the countryside. Um, but as far as 
cooling towers are concerned, it's not just geothermal that has cooling towers. I did a visit to the Anheuser-Busch uh, sure. uh, uh, brewery, and I'm going, wait a minute, those are cooling towers, just like they have at the Kaisers. And different um, companies or different types of industry, there are various industries that use cooling towers quite similarly as the cooling towers that we have here. You know, it, it's pretty darn amazing. But some of the wells are shut in, Carrie, that they can't be used for reinjection. They can't be used to generate steam anymore, so they'll shut those in. But they're not eyesores. No, they are not they're, eyesores. Well, the eyesores could be, you could kind of say that. But I mean, most of the geysers is inside mm -hmm. the geysers. You can't even go there. Mm -hmm. So the only people that really see what's inside the geysers are the people that work there, mm -hmm. other than in Lake County, where mm -hmm. you can see that those those plants that are. We can see them on the hill at night. <laughs> yes, <laughs> not like we, we used to. Yeah. Do you remember when we had so many wells on the hill it looked like there were a bunch of Christmas trees Christmas up there and, uh, in the 80s and the 90s? I mean, it would, you could come home at night and it's like, wow. Christmas. Yeah, yeah, up, up on the hills. So we have a lot fewer of those. They are still developing some, and as John mentioned, they're looking at developing them deeper. And, and yes, they learned a lot, because most of the drillers were coming from the oil fields, and it was different once they got into geothermal, how, yeah. they, how they developed. Uh, we worked as a community with Freeport MacMoran, before they sold their interest, and then Unical, uh, Uni Unical. Unical was there, which was originally Union Oil, yeah. but they developed a different name when they came up to the geysers. I mean, it was a feeding frenzy for a while. I mean, it was a place you definitely wanted to invest your money because they saw it as, wow, there's a, a lot of potential here. Yeah. And but, green power pays a lot more. Mm -hmm. So not only... And as you became an uh, electrical distributor, you had to have a certain portion of green. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you, all of the companies that are here have to have some. And geothermal, you could either buy into it, mm -hmm. buy from PG or Calpine or whoever was doing it, but you, you had to have a certain amount, you know. So it made it, that's what made the frenzy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that everybody came up all of a sudden and you know tried to get in on. And then Northern California Power Agency NCPA uh, was a consortium of cities and communities for to create the two power plants that are even though they are in Sonoma County, they yeah. are right on the county line. You know. Yeah. Yes, they, they did that. Yes, they yeah. did. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, yeah, that's the, the geysers power plants. They, they run 24 hours a day unless they trip. And then when they trip, that's when I, that's when I had to go to work. Because first I started as a power plant operator. So as an operator, all you do is walk around and take note. You know, so many, such temperatures, so pressures, everything's where it's supposed to be. That was your job, until it tripped. And they tripped. Back in that day, they tripped frequently. So you always started one or two a night. You know, in the middle of the night, all the lights go out. You have to, you know. So it was an interesting development. And after five years of doing that, mm -hmm. I, I wore out again. Five years seemed to be my limit of things. So then I, I'd had Ten years at the geysers, and with ten years, I got a job as a, a as a electrical trainer. So I went into the electrical field to become an electrician. So that's a three-year program with PG&E. So for three years, I took a cut and pay. In the end, I got to be an electrician, and once again, I sat around. It was easy until it tripped. And then when it tripped, you had to figure out why. Yes? What causes it to trip? The question is, what causes um, a power plant 
to trip. There's books on that. Everything. <laughs> Steam, uh, faults on the wire, of course, or faults in the, in the unit. Uh, you never know. It, you have a, uh, a board that has uh, 50 little windows in it, and that kind of tells you what area to look in. But then you have to take out the prints and try and figure out why that did this. Yeah, so lots of times uh, you'd be, you know, they, they, they would happen, if they happened at night, you weren't there, they called you in, and then you got to start. Or you just, you know, it happened, it, it, it happened at any time of day or night. And for any number of reasons, was there any safety risk when that happened? Uh, there's a lot of electricity in those plants. Yeah, you know, there's a caged area that carries the high voltage. You have to go in there sometimes to check things. You have to, like if the plant trips and you can't figure it out, you have to do what's called clear the plant. That means you remove the power from the generator. It's not running, but you have 13, 8, 14,000 volt switches that you have to open and clear. You have 480 volt stations for all the pumps and equipment. It's high voltage stuff, that, that stuff. And then there's always the chance of something breaking and breaking, you know? Uh, the pumps and the things, they, they can get shorted out sometimes. And, they blow out, you know. There's been cooling tower troubles. I mean, the towers are made of wood and they carry all that water. It's, it's amazing that they, but they made them out of redwood originally, you know, and that was, you know, a wise thing on their part as far as lasting. But, um, you know, after 20 years or so, then, you know, they make them with steel and stuff now, mm -hmm. uh, stainless steel. At one time, they had to, they plan outages. So as opposed to a tripping without knowledge, uh, it's similar to we had a planned outage from PG&E in our community uh, this past Thursday, where they sent notices and we're going to be offline while they are working on something. So it's sort of like you're having uh, your breaker panel at your home, and then all of a sudden something goes off, and you don't know why, well maybe they put, you put too much of an energy strain on it, and so the breaker tripped, it tripped your breaker to turn it off, and then you have to unplug something to make sure that you're not overloading that, that area. But one of the things that was interesting in terms of the steam that comes out, you think it's going to be clean steam, the steam is clean that's coming out of the ground, and it is not clean steam, and it has particles of all kinds of things. And when they build the little loops that they, for the area, it's so that the, the larger particles can drop out before it gets to the turbines to turn the turbines. Yeah, uh -huh. that's a good thing. Uh -huh. and yes. It, the turbines, okay, that takes you back to the unit, the, the protect, uh, maintenance on this, on the plants is every three years, I think. They shut the plant down for uh, six weeks, eight mm -hmm. weeks, and tear it all apart. Take it all down to the beginning, because the geothermal steam is so corrosive, it, 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 the turbines are Blades. made with titanium, mm -hmm. and they eat them up. Yeah, it's, the ones in, our area aren't as bad as, I don't know, we had one power plant over where I live in Cobb that when the state tried to get in on geothermal, they built two plants. One of them was right over by five and six, which is right at the beginning. The other one was right outside, my, I can see it from my house. The one over by my house, they ran. The other one, they never tested the field there wasn't any steam there. So they built a power plant with no steam. What? This one had steam. They never found a source of metal that could withstand the corrosion. 
every year or two they were buying a new turbine and replacing it and they went to super titanium things because it was still paying well i mean it was a like a 50 megawatt plant or whatever it was good enough for the money but uh yeah but again, the, the idea risk, of shutting it down and putting a new term. The risk to the communities, though. Pardon? The, what about the risk to the communities? Well, they, oh, no, at that point, they were taking all of the non-condensable gases and treating them. And they it's, got it all. It's, yeah, pretty it's much the so, other yes. stuff in there yes. that eats the turbines. So Corrosive. Uh, mm -hmm. The water, like very corrosive water, very corrosive steam. Carrie was asking, what about the risk to the community? Well, what happens is once that steam has gone through the turbine, that's the raw steam, so to speak, and that's the part where the corrosiveness is. And then they also have uh, what we talked about last month, a turbine bypass, so that if the plant trips, there you have to bypass the turbine and it goes through the cleaning process even once it's bypassed the turbine because what it used to do is they used to just vent it to the atmosphere and then you'd hear all this noise and you'd get the rotten egg smell and all kinds of things. Well, they know they, after sufficient complaints from the community, they found ways in which it would not impact us. Um, and so they cleaned, uh, they, they call it scrubbing. They scrubbed the steam so that we didn't get that impact but it still corroded the turbines. And when you, you say, well, why would they check it out without knowing there was steam there? Well, at the time that they were finding steam all over the place, people wanted to get in on it. And so they said, we'll build this power plant while they're developing the steam field. Well, they didn't develop the steam confirmed the steam field before they built the power plant and then the steam in this other area was so dirty that it corroded and it did not make sense so sometimes people get ahead of themselves in in terms of developing a new industry yes sheila so i have an oddball question <laughs> so when you talk about the things that go through the pipes and how they have those little squares well, yes not little they're huge but yes um, and that's supposed to catch the things that make the steam dirty. Do you have to file something with a commission or anything like an SEC filing to show what's in that steam? Absolutely. Okay. So we have the California Energy Commission who were the ones from the state standpoint that would approve the development of the steam field and approve the development of, or the construction of a power plant. Also, each county had its own um, agencies that would um, look at what that development would, it's called, it, they would have the environmental impact report, saying in developing this uh, project, how is it going to impact the surrounding area? How, and that was when they called the people of Anderson Springs receptors. <laughs> and, and I took offense at being a receptor. <laughs> we are people, we are human beings. But uh, yeah, no, there, there were a number of processes. Just like a water company has to do an annual report on what are the, what's in your water, they have to do reports, they have to make reports on what's in the steam, if there's a change in that, or yes. <coughs> yes. It, it's amazing how much you get to learn when someone is um, developing something in your backyard. You want to know, you want to know how is it going to impact us. And I would say other than the earthquakes, we've had very few noise, noise complaints recently. Uh, in the olden no, days. Hey, look, it's here! Hey! How are you? Like I still work at Calpine, late. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I, had I've been it. saying so many nasty things about you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, it's great having you here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. John has done a wonderful job talking about the development of the. Um, of the actual power plants, what goes on in the cooling towers, and 
we were just mentioning the big loops that are in the um, steam pipes and that they're to help drop out the particles. Well, the loops are actually expansion loops mm -hmm. because that steam's coming up at probably 350 degrees. And so when the pipes cool, that loop actually is sitting in a little or out a little bit so the loop's not really a perfect loop it kind of goes out and when the steam starts coming it expands that pipe and so all the pipe stanchions that hold the pipe along the route to the plant are sitting on skids and they actually slide back and forth as a, and those expansion loops mm -hmm. pick up that so they don't fall off their stanchions and and those are I thought they were also used for stuff to drop out of the steam when it's going through. We have what they call drop pots uh -huh. along the steam line and sometimes they'll go put them before expansion loop. Uh -huh. But so the steam condenses, a lot of it will condense mm -hmm. and, and uh, so it sinks to the bottom of the pipe and then you have what's called a knockout pond. Mm -hmm. And the water drips down into that, and you got a level control. And once it gets high enough, it dumps it into a, the condensate line, which mm -hmm. goes down to a low point where we have our condensate pumps, mm -hmm. which pumps it back to the power plant <coughs> where it gets re injected back into the ground. When the steam does too, of course, after it's condensed. What is the furthest distance a well can be from a power plant? and still be effective? That's a good question, but I think we have one well that's probably probably a mile of right <coughs> Really? Yeah. yeah. That's a long way. Yes, because it is. Because the longer it travels, the less uh, heat it's carrying or... It, did, it, loses. That, uh, uh, it loses it as it goes. You know, the pipeline isn't as big as it looks because it's that's the... the the uh, insulation of the pipeline, like mm -hmm. that thing, and I think it's R19. Am I correct? Uh, it's the, no, I don't it's the know that. best insulation mm -hmm. you can get. You can take your hand on it; it's cold, but there's 350 degrees in, on the other Inside. side of that pipe. And uh, so, when West Ford Flat shut down, to give you mm -hmm. an example, which was mm -hmm. the lowest power plant, they built a pipeline all the way to Unit 16 and kept the steam really? from West Ford Flat. Wow. So probably over a mile of pipeline. Yeah. And you know, when you got 300 PSI, 300 pounds per, pounds per square inch of steam, there's a lot of power. Yeah. Yes. So the a big object is not to have them fall off by the top of the That's skids. That's right. Oh, the skids, right. Yeah, the right. skids. Yes. Are there any other questions? Well, it certainly has been a, a wonderful opportunity to talk to two gentlemen who have spent a, a total of 60 years in oh, the... Are we all, uh, oh, we all... Oh, yeah, 60 years working in the geysers, and there are a couple of us who have lived uh, experiencing the geysers for 50 and 47 years, so 20 years. and 20 years. So oh, we've got right some yeah. who, 20. Uh -huh, who who lived and experienced it. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Daughter was gone for a long time. Oh, oh yeah. She, yeah, yeah. We're not counting Kara. We're just counting <laughs> Sheila, <laughs> you and me. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, next month we are uh, we may have a special um, guest from the County Museum staff who may be talking about preservation of photos, family photos, and things of that nature. Yes. Other, any other questions? How many uh, steam wells are there now? How many steam wells? It's really hard to estimate because they're shutting them in on a regular basis. There's probably between NCPA and Cal Pine probably over 500. Oh, wow. Really? Probably 500, mm -hmm. let's see, 500. No, that way, that's way up. Each pad probably holds six six wells, and we had seven pads, 
So no, I'm way off. There's probably a hundred wells up there okay. between NCPA, Calpine, Westport, like, you know, but East West guys. Yeah, there's a lot of yeah, a lot of wells. And when they well. and as I mentioned earlier, when they first started drilling wells, they only drilled one well from for uh, per pad, yeah. and then they developed the diagonal drilling. Directional. Drilling. Direction. Thank you. Yeah. Directional drilling. Yes. So those are all active. But hundred wells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, some of them are reinjection wells where we mm -hmm. put the water back in the ground. Mm -hmm. Sheila, yes. are there any sideways wells going through the springs? Are there any directional wells uh, going to my through the No, we, did, we haven't done that. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of directional drills, you know. Down. Yeah, mm -hmm. where they drill, so they know there's steam in this pocket. And then so the next well is 40 feet away, and then they'll kick off another direction. And directional drilling, it's pretty impressive. And you know, and the wells, I think one well is over two miles deep. That's deep. That's a long way to drill, you know. Wow. But the average depth is probably a mile, mile and a half. Do we know what percent of our population is employed at the geysers? I know Calpine employs 300, and oh, a majority of mm -hmm. majority of them are probably from Lake County, Coastville, mm -hmm. so, Lakeport. Yeah, the question was, how many or what's the percentage of Lake County's population that are employed by the geysers? And that has changed over the years. At the heyday before they developed a lot of the electronic, uh, um, of the ability to see what the levels were at different wells, they were manually doing a lot of things. And because at one time we had a lot of drilling going on in the geysers, there was a time there were over 1,500, I would say, employees. Um, you know, just from what happened with the school district, where we went from 350 students in um, 1978 to 1984, where we had over 1,200 students. I mean, we expanded insanely from the Middletown Unified School District. That was one of the reasons we built the elementary school on Cobb because we had so many children living in on the mountain from people who were working in the geysers, we couldn't run enough buses to bring the kids to Middletown. And the same thing with Hidden Valley, that's the, one of the reasons they built the Coyote Valley School. But that was more the commuters over to, over to Sonoma County. But definitely when we built the, uh, the Cobb Mountain School, it was as a result of students from uh, parents who worked at the geysers. Well, there was at least 12 to 14 operators up there, different yes. operators. Yeah, maybe more. Mm -hmm. At each plant? Well, uh, for the, uh, Muriel was saying that there were 12 to 14 operators. These are different drilling companies yeah. oh, as yeah. well as the, because you know, at one time it was before Freeport McMoran. What was it called? Who did Bill Woods work for before? Amon Oil. Amon Oil. Yes. Yeah. Amon Oil was up there. Union Oil was up there. I mean, Occidental was up oh, there. Every, we, everybody. I mean, we had so yeah. many different oh, yeah. uh, developers who yeah. were in the area. Yeah. Uh, it was extraordinary. Oh. And then. Um, at one time, pg &E and uh, NCPA were the, the operators of the power plants, and you had the independent drillers, and then pg and &E went, they consolidated, and they uh, then uh, Calpine. Calpine bought out not only the field, the, the drilling, the whole thing, the whole thing and the, the power plants also. Yeah, and pg and &E sold it. Yeah, so I worked. I started off with Ox. When, you, when you're in Middletown, you look up at night and you see that big string of lights. That's Unit 19, which is called the Cal Stover Unit. But I started off there in the 70s with Occidental. They started building, they built the plant. Then they sold it to Santa Fe, 
Santa Fe sold it to Florida Power and Light, and Florida Power and Light sold it to Calpine. So I went through four companies. It was originally owned by Farm and Hammer Company. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that built that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really? Farm and Hammer, you know, the soda company. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> huh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, an unusual plant, to say the least. <laughs> uh, okay. I worked there, too. Wow. Uh -huh. I tried them all. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for joining us sure. for this presentation, and thank you, gentlemen, for sure. the offerings that you have made. Um, this is an exciting opportunity for an industry and a community to work cooperatively. Uh, and it has had a real beneficial impact on our community, whether it was from the 1905 uh, funds that came into the county, and basically the economy was boasted, boosted by the geothermal, and that was the one of the reasons that we got our park across the street, as well as the new senior center and the new library. It was based on geothermal, and other uh, companies in our community were, uh, developed and grew based on geothermal. One is Harvester's Markets. They built a store on Cobb based on the fact that it had grown significantly during the time of geothermal. They expanded their operations here in Middletown based on that. Um, the, during that same time, the school district built a new library and science area. We built a new gymnasium um, during that same time. Yes, Mary. The cemetery project with the office, uh, the roads, everything was done with geothermal mineral. Wow. Right. Everything. Wow. So that's when the taxes were really good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Mary used to be the manager of the Middletown Cemetery District. At one time, our cemetery was very sad, but, uh, to put it mildly. And with the funds that came and the tax base that right. increased from having geothermal in our area, they were able to do extraordinarily beneficial uh, projects to, to our cemetery. As and so we give thanks to that industry and what it meant yeah. to our community. You too. Yes, in <laughs> and these gentlemen in retirement yeah, are giving yeah. thanks. <laughs> yeah, good. yeah, if you ever have an opportunity, <clears throat> go to the Calpine Visitor Center. They're a lot more in depth and uh, give a lot more descriptions of the geysers and mm -hmm. oh, yeah. past and future. Or, you know. Mm -hmm. Are they still doing tours? I see that they had a sign the other day. I saw a sign that says not open to the public. And I don't know if that was because of COVID or... Mm -hmm. I think it probably was. Yeah. And, and possibly next spring they will bring them back yeah. because it's mainly for the um, the summer visitor se no, season. It, it has started it again? Started oh. Oh. The oh, every Friday? Friday. Thank, Thank you, Millie. Oh, so we'll put that on our Facebook page. To my community. And <laughs> Millie Simon, our vice president, definitely pays but attention they're, they're, to our community. Yeah, they already started. Okay, mm -hmm. good deal. Yeah. And I think during the heyday, the geysers were putting out 2,300 megawatts. Now they're down to like eight or nine hundred with MCPA. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in a megawatt will supply a thousand homes. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of people to supply. How many, how many did you say they're doing now? How much? They're doing eight to nine hundred between NCPA and Calpine. And you know, they said that uh, geothermal is clean energy, and to some degree it is. <coughs> However, there are the off gases that in, impact as well as the potential for spills into our nearby creeks and areas and then the earthquakes as well. So it is not just 100% green, but once you put the protections on it and limit the impact, then it is greener than if you were uh, burning coal or burning oil. Um, not quite as clean as hydro, but uh, yeah. Green power. Nothing beats hydro. Yeah, nothing no, beats hydro, but, but we need rain. To yeah. get to that, yeah, got to have a Okay, rolling finger. <laughs> well, 
Well, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Deborah.